Director of Homeland Security for DuPage County. Those of you from this area, just about 30 miles west of here. Uh, after that, I worked uh, for the First Lady, who was your luncheon speaker today. I worked for her husband. I worked for Governor Rauner as the Director for the State of Illinois Emergency Management Agency, and now here with FEMA in this role. And so, from a first response perspective, it's always that local and county and state uh, first responders first. But then when it comes to recovery, people always think when they look at the wildfires in California that occurred last year, also occurring now, uh, with the impacts of Texas and Florida and Puerto Rico with the hurricanes, is that FEMA comes in and makes them whole again. And that's not true. FEMA is just a stopgap measure to help kickstart recovery. And what that means is when you look at an individual that may have, whether it's a $100,000 home, a $25,000 trailer, or a million dollar mansion, if they come to FEMA for assistance, regardless of what their losses are and what their property value is, the maximum that FEMA is providing or the federal government is providing from FEMA in disaster assistance is $34,000. That's the maximum that you could achieve from any type of grant. And those are not loans that don't need to be paid back. Any type of grant that the federal department may provide. And that's if and only if the situation was so severe that it becomes a presidentially declared disaster. Here in Illinois, uh, I, while I was the state director, we had several tornadoes, several tornado events, several flooding events, several situations that prompted residents to have to evacuate their homes, shelter in place, or take some kind of protective action where it was not a presidentially declared disaster. Therefore, that federal assistance is not there. And even though the maximum on, 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 on recovery from an individual assistance perspective is $34,000, does anyone know what the average is that a homeowner may receive? I'm gonna tell you, it's between four and $6,000. You got some great branding. Everyone thinks you're God, and look at you. Well, <laughs> everyone thinks we're God until we have to say no, and then we're the devil, right? So, so the most important thing that we tell people all the time is while the average payout with the hurricane and wildfire season that we had in 2017 was between four and six thousand dollars the average payout from an insurance policy was well into the six figures 120 125 130 thousand dollars to help that homeowner recover whether it may be for interim hotel assistance that they may have needed or to to maintain or recover their their home and their property so when i get in front of individuals i'll tell you the two people i need the most the two groups i need the most right now in this country are financial advisors to help people become more financially resilient because fema always says right have a 72 hour supply kit have you guys heard that before? Have three days worth of food and clothing and water for you and everyone in your family. How do I honestly look people in the eye and say that when 40% of this country doesn't know where their next meal is coming from? How do I tell them to provide for three days worth of sustainment? So it's financial advisors to help people become more financially resilient and, 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 and financially secure in their everyday walk of life, but then also realtors as well. Because every realtor wants a renter to become a homeowner, right? And I want every homeowner to have the proper level of insurance. So that's a quick snapshot, Desiree, of the, of the, uh, of the process and why the individual assistance program is often misconstrued about how insurance really kickstarts recovery for that individual, in addition to some of the other federal programs that exist. Well, thank you very much for that. So the clarity he put forth was unbelievable, James, because the idea is, is that they're repair, they're safety, they're the immediate danger that they're coming in with those few dollars, to be honest. The SBA is the Economic Recovery Act is the one who actually comes in and does the 40,000. It can be used for a car, it can be used for a computer, a laptop, anything. Homeowner can go up to 200,000. I'm sorry, the application time for the SBA versus you, minor. And at 1.75% interest, that's free money for no payment for an entire year. The bad news, now I take my hat off of the SBA and put it back on as Editor B, is death and taxes in SBA have the same problem. You will never get rid of it. It will happen. You will pay back your SBA loan. There's no <laughs> foreclosure. There's no, you can get away with it. You borrow the money, you pay it back. It goes, it travels with your body. So, <laughs> but, And also, if I could add to that, like you Go said, ahead. is our process Cumbersome? Yes, it absolutely is. Has anyone here ever had to work with FEMA as a disaster survivor or helping someone? 
If you haven't, you have. And you know how lengthy that process can be, right? For everyone else, count your blessings because it is a very cumbersome process, which is why as an organization, not just as a result of what's happened in the 2017 disaster cycle, but just because it makes sense, we have a very aggressive, uh, yet I believe attainable strategic plan. And there's three main goals of that strategic plan. is number one, build a culture of preparedness, talking about what we're talking about here, financial preparedness, having the proper levels of insurance, Two, uh, readying this nation for catastrophic disasters. We saw that the response at that state and local level varied greatly when we talk about uh, the response to the 2017 disaster season. If I look at this chair here, well, this chair is not a great example, but one of those chairs with four legs, we just kind of have like a U-shaped bracket under these chairs, that doesn't work. But if you look at the four legs of that chair there, there's four key components to recovery of an event. The federal government will be there, but the state and local government needs to be there as well and have capacity and capability. The private sector, we work very closely with them from a information sharing back and forth perspective in a disaster, but also assisting us with commodities and distribution. And then lastly, the individual citizen needs to be prepared as well. When I look at a lot of the events that happened in 2017, in many of those situations, all four legs of the chair were there. If any one of those legs is not existent, it becomes very unstable, right? That chair, if only one leg exists, it's not possible at all. There is, there's some locations where we went where it was the only was, it only was the federal government that was there having any type of response or recovery aspect to the disaster. So build a culture of preparedness, ready the nation for catastrophic disasters. And my personal favorite, having been a county guy and a state guy before, is reduce the complexity of FEMA. A lot of that could be legislative, some of it could be internal policy, but really taking a look at how do I get the support? Even if it's only four or $6,000 or more, how do I push that support out as quickly as possible to the survivors in the community because they absolutely need it the most? You hire Sharon. She wrote the first strategic plan for the FHFA. She can slay it. There you go, Sharon. Spare <laughs> time. Come on by. <laughs> you didn't know she was a lawyer for 30, how many years? Almost 35. <laughs> there you go, there you go. So if we took off the word infrastructure, sorry, if we took off the word disaster recovery and we apply that to the homeowners and small businesses from the procuring contract side, how would FHFA, you have business opportunities. So I don't want you go into like the big numbers or little numbers and how that's declining, but you offer opportunity through the procuring contracts of FHFA that might be applicable to some very strange opportunity within here. And I'd like to hear about that. So we're a small agency to begin with. We were formed in 2010 and compared uh, with and to the other federal agencies, we're, we're minute. So we're about 600 employees and our budget is uh, minuscule also compared to the FDICs of the world, so I think it's about 43, not our budget, our, our, our uh, procurement spend. Uh, last year I think it was about 43 million. Um, about 26 or 27 percent of that last year was spent uh, with minority and women-owned businesses. And so we uh, take our contractors from, uh, well they compete, but our contractors are all on the GSA schedule, so you need, in order to, to become an FHG vendor, vendor, you need to have been approved by the GSA and be on their schedule. So, um, in, in order to do that, it tends to be a lengthy process, but it's certainly worth it if, if you want um, to participate in our contracting opportunities. Um, we have, if you go on the website, our particular FHFA.gov website, there is a link uh, or a tab for how to do business with FHFA. You would click on that link, you would go through the process, you would register. Um, again, you have to be a GSA uh, schedule vendor to, to be able to do work with us. But that in essence, in a nutshell, is, is how you get into the system uh, to be considered for opportunities with us. Very cool, very cool. And you'll hear more about that other agencies, but very similar to it. So thank you for that. So. If, Michelle, you have some very interesting programs that are out there about um, dealing with the USDA, uh, about the Single Family Housing Guarantee Loan Program. Talk to about that, us. Well, everybody always says USDA housing, aren't you meat and grain and um, forest service and, and um, other 
other parts of USDA, there's a game that um, you're supposed to be able to play. Some people play it as a drinking game, um, where where they'll say, "Do they do this at USDA?" And if you can't answer the question, then you have to drink. Um, it, it really it's a true game. I've never played it though. That's I, that's I, why I joined FEMA and not the. <laughs> this but, is but we the do. Yeah, we do so many different things, but within rural development, we have um, three specific missions, and it's housing, rural utilities, and rural, rural business. And so within rural business, um, they do loans and grants um, to either expand or start new businesses in eligible rural areas. Um, rural utilities, they're doing water waste, um, water treatment, wastewater treatment, um, solid waste disposal, um, broadband. And then within housing, um, we have a, a, a number of different missions, including single family housing, multifamily housing, and community facilities. And under the community facilities umbrella, they're doing things like libraries, town halls, fire stations, fire trucks, um, healthcare facilities, things like that. Um, in single family housing, we're actually broken up into two divisions. We have the direct loan division, that's where the government makes and services the loan. Um, we fund the loan. And then in the guaranteed division, where I work, is where we have um, 3,000 give or take approved lenders across the country making and servicing um, USDA loans. Did we say kitchen sink? <laughs> I mean, really? So one of our, um, last year, um, one of our uh, ladies that was coming out to speak actually was called in to do a procuring contract for the USDA to do the appraisals for nationally. Um, and um, she won the contract. And the idea is, is that, so imagine, how many of you know of anyone who does appraisals in the, in the world, in the industry? So she bid on it, not an appraiser, as a real estate brokerage co uh, company, to bid on the contract and want it. So the idea is, is that we're trying to facilitate the ecosystem here on what that means like, right? So let's go ahead and um, uh, let's address to Noemi real quick because she hasn't done a whole lot other than brag about me. Um, let's go ahead and brag talk some about, more. <laughs> brag some more. That's a bad thing? <laughs> Uh, after this, we can talk. Uh, but anyway, uh, so Nemi, you're you have a very interesting um, background. I mean, fish and game. You know, you're you, you hear about all the 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 parks being removed. You hear about the changes with the new administration and how that impacts you know all the natural beauty. You know, I'm 58 now, and I look at all the parks in Yosemite and everything that had been out there and they're removing some godly percentage. Talk to me about that. I'm going to connect some dots for you. Um, and when I first saw the questions associated with this panel, I thought it was very apropos. I was actually part of a PR agency's team that was hired by State Farm um, in response to Katrina. So Katrina, which was over 10 years ago now, um, had a bad problem in PR and the way it responded to homeowners. Um, many, and I don't know if any of you remember any, I don't know if State Farm is represented here. It's not an attempt to smear a State Farm. Um, and it very specifically, it had a problem, um, a perception problem in the African American community, okay? Because of obviously New Orleans, Katrina. But if you just very briefly, uh, many homeowners were being denied um, getting state their coverage based on oh it was not it was not flooding it was wind damage right <laughs> or no it wasn't flooding it was wind damage you know so pick or choose which one um, but the bottom line was that that moment in US history impacted US natural response systems FEMA uh, it really did. Uh, but also the insurance industry and its coverage of homeowners, home ownership. And basically the rule of thumb has become, you get everything, right? Tsunami, flooding, wind, uh, a tornado, thunder, you know, just, just cover yourself as much as possible. The other piece of that puzzle though is, is I'm connecting the dots here. Um, 
you know, I don't know how many of you pay attention to the green spaces around you. Oftentimes we take advantage of it, right? We just, we just know those green spaces are there. Um, in New Orleans, there are actual wildlife refuges um, and other park spaces that are meant to act as buffer between the ocean and the city. And their purpose, scientifically, is to literally absorb storms when they come in. They're like sponges. And that's part, partly why parks and wildlife refuges are important. It's, yes, they're beautiful. Yes, it's about preserving aesthetically um, nature, the wildlife that lives there. There's a health component to us as, as humans. But the other part is actually creating a buffer between urban development and nature. Okay, um, and so there's a key component to that. Um, certainly for those of you, all of you who are in the mortgage industry or, or on the real estate side, you know that when property is near natural areas, it also has an, a spike in value. Okay, um, so several reasons why nature is a value to, to real estate, um, to us as humans, and why sh we should definitely uh, not only advocate for it, but encourage that green space. It's not just about you know having somewhere to go and making it pretty, but really it's intended to be a buffer. It's that sponge. If a natural disaster happens and there's a, a flood or, a, you know, the sky breaks apart and there's an overwhelming uh, storm, it's intended to absorb all of that and help the water sort of steer away. So I hope that answered the question. It's great because think about if you have a fire in the middle of nowhere and you're not near the ocean and you need a water drop, the helicopters come in and take the water out of the lake, right? So if you have no more lakes and all dried up like they were 10 years ago, you're out. The firemen can only suck up so much water out of your house, right? Or at swimming pools. And, 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 I love and if I can add, and, and this is, uh, this is um, a reprieve for FEMA, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was one of the first responders to Katrina. Why? Because they were already physically there and they had boats. And they were actually the people, if you remember the, the coverage on CNN and other news sources, and you saw these people in their green uniforms coming up in boats helping people out, those were actually U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service staff. Um, and so they were there, you know, and they're a federal agency. They sort of stepped over the line, right, in the area that belongs to FEMA, you know, whether it's uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, National Park Service, or other federal agencies, they're present, they're there, and there's a, like USDA mentioned, there's a, an overlap in different ways where natural resources and land is concerned. Yeah, I want to add to that also is when we talk, sorry, I mean, to pick up there. you know, when we talk about open space and, and the need for it, you know, time and time again, when I was with the state of Illinois and I was on the ground after a major flood occurred and there was homes that were flooded and roadways that were flooded, you know, I would hear from homeowners say, I didn't know that this area was going to flood. But we'd always say, stop and let's think for a moment, let's go back 20, 30 years because that's not just an area that was likely to flood, that's the floodway or the spillway. And that is where, when there is an overflow, as Noah was mentioning, that's where the water was intended to go. But at some point, somebody at a local, uh, local level of government said, you know what, if we develop homes there or businesses there, we can collect tax revenue off of it. So they took the risk of building in the floodplain. And obviously you as realtors know when you sell a home or show a home that's in the floodplain that has to be disclosed. As long as they have a mortgage on their property, there's certain insurance that they need to have as a result. But there's so many people that seem not to know because they either were misinformed or underinformed or decided at some point in their life to to disregard where that danger zone and that risk was and they built there. Which is why now when we look at how we rebuild after a disaster, we talk about the city of Houston, we talk about uh, uh, parts of Texas and Florida, even Puerto Rico, we need to build to a higher, more resilient standard. So that we are building homes, uh, building homes and businesses and buildings and government buildings, especially back in Puerto Rico that could withstand the effects of a hurricane if they, uh, the, the wind and the water and, and the water rise that occurs, but also when we talk about homes and we talk about businesses and property, doing as much mitigation as we can, which is why I'm proud of FEMA in the next uh, 30 days or so in, in, in the end of August, early September, I'm hosting the insurance commissioners of all five, of all six states in Region 5. 
I'm hosting the emergency managers of all six of those states and the directors of Department of Natural Resources to say, I need you to help me prevent this stuff from happening. How do we encourage more insurance purchasing within, within uh, flooded areas? And if it can rain in your community, it can flood in your community. Where it can rain, it will flood in some way, shape, or form. How that impacts you or not is, is different. But also letting people know, as Noe mentioned, not all your homeowner's insurance policy does not cover damage from floods. You need a separate flood insurance policy for that. So, in, so how do we increase uh, insurance purchases amongst homeowners? How do we increase mitigation and rebuilding stronger? And not only that, if you look at senior citizens throughout the disaster areas that, that were impacted by wildfires and hurricanes and floods last year, they were adversely impacted because you had a whole group of people who had finally paid off their mortgages and thought, I don't need insurance anymore. And now they had two $250,000, $300,000 homes that were destroyed and they have no insurance to help them cover it because to save a few extra hundred dollars a year or to add that to their pocketbook, they cancel their insurance policy. So ensuring that we increase that education out there as well. And to the extent that uh, these homes have mortgages, this is, this is a demonstration of how connected we are in that housing ecosystem. But to the extent that these homes have mortgages on them, then an agency like FHFA, we must ensure that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in particular, who hold the loans on, on most of those houses, um, have underwriting requirements that are pretty strict when it comes to obtaining uh, liability insurance, not only liability insurance, but uh, uh, casualty insurance as well and flood insurance, earthquake to the extent it exists in, in California, earthquake insurance, uh, because it is, it is critical. These are loans that are on the books of our regulated entities that can cause safety and, sam uh, <laughs> safety and soundness issues. I do this every day. Safety and soundness issues um, significantly that will, will affect their, their bottom line if, if uh, that insurance is not in place. Well, look at Hurricane. Um, um, in Houston and Harvey, one of every five homes had insurance. Yeah. I mean, that's a serious wipeout. They were selling homes over full price, or they could sell them for five, ten percent on below market because they had a glut in the property inventory. And then, as soon as the hurricane hit, they were going way over market because there wasn't enough housing for the contractors to live in to build the homes. And so a lot of it depends on servicers too, right? Mm -hmm. The servicers of the loans to ensure that each year when the insurance uh, expiration date comes up that they be reinstated, renewed, uh, and, and be put in place or uh, using the force place mechanism to ensure that, mm -hmm. that the homeowners have coverage. So fabulous here, thank you for that tie back into it. So, Michelle, go ahead and talk about your programs that you offer that a lot of people here in the, in the audience doesn't know anything about your programs. I can guarantee you that right now. <laughs> um, Guaranteed right now. So, um, within the, the Guaranteed program, um, we offer um, loans to eligible um, folks who are at 115% of median income and want to live in an eligible rural area. If you want to find out the answer to those two questions for your customer, you can go to our website. We have an eligibility site. You can type in the property address. It'll tell you it's eligible. You can type in the borrower's information about their income, and it'll tell you if they are income eligible or not. Um, once you get past those two points, then it's just a matter of finding them, finding them a home that they want. Um, so, but what we've noticed in rural America and probably in suburban and urban America too is that there's a lack of inventory. And it's not just affordable inventory, but it's affordable, decent, safe, and sanitary. So what we did in 2016 was we added a new product to our lineup that's a single close construction. And it benefits everybody in the transaction, including realtors and lenders in the bar. Um, so for the, for the lender, what happens is, is that we issue the loan guarantee immediately after the loan closing. So you've closed on the lot, we're going to issue the guarantee at that point. So they can then put the loan into a security. Um, most of them, 95% go into Ginny security, the rest then kind of go between Freddie and Fannie. Um, the realtor can get paid at the first loan closing in full. You don't have to wait till the end of the construction period. 
And then the borrower gets a house that's brand new. They're not going in to an older home where they might have some problems very soon after with the roof or the AC or whatever. Um, so it's a really, it's really good for all the parties in the transaction and then how that radiates out is it's great for communities. You've got a, a new water and sewer hookup which helps support the local utility. Um, there's businesses that are going to be in, positively impacted by that for restaurants and other services and the building supply company and, and all of those things. So we're really excited about that. There hasn't been quite the uptake that we've wanted to see since 2016, but what we've discovered is that a lot of the smaller lenders don't have the back office operation to support construction lending. So what we've been doing is connecting those lenders with third party providers like Land Gorilla and some of the others that do that back office um, construction draw monitoring. Um, so we're hoping that in, in FY19 to be able to really increase use in this program. Did you hear that they loaned directly to build a house on raw land? How many banks went on raw land? And this is for stick build housing or manufactured or modular housing. All of you out there, please take notice. All right, so yeah, so it's incredible. I mean, you get, you know, the, you have a home, gets wiped out, and here we are in Ventura County, where I was born, California. We did a panel up there for home ownership, and we had the fires, as you know, wiped out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of homes. And I invited my aunt and several other people, and so so happens to be that her caretaker's daughter, home, had been completely burned down. The moral story is, is that she didn't know, she knew of FEMA, but didn't want to do all the paperwork. She knew nothing about the SBA, knew nothing about that the city was allowing them to rebuild the entire home without a permit. They have over 100 contractors approved by the city that they don't need a single permit to build the home because they've already been vetted by the city because they were so backlogged by so many, would be for so many homes that had burned down to the ground that they needed to have it vetted and they had signed a compliance they would build it to quote city codes. So here she walks in, in one meeting, knowing where she could get money, where she could get an insurance company that would cover 140%, 125%, I believe it was, from farmers. Here was a city official saying that she didn't have to have any permits, supplied her list of contractors, and then access some money. And here she was living in, in, in a hotel. These are the opportunities that if we all connect and talk are out there. So. Being in Ventura County, which is, used to be the highest agricultural county in the United States, I don't know if it still is, um, with all the construction they've put out over the years, all the best strawberries in the world are in Oxnard and Camarillo, just FYI. But, <laughs> that's my, I could eat 10 pounds a day and not bother me at all. Um, but the fact that there's so much rural ground still out there in California, I see a lot here in Illinois and several other states as I fly over to go to DC on a regular basis. Um, that opportunity, is it available in every state? Is it available, how, how do I quantify it to get everyone excited here? Um, well, 90% of America is rural, believe it or not. If you, if you, if you look at our overlay map on our website, it, it's, it's about 90% rural. And even states like New Jersey have eligible rural areas. So South Jersey area, um, there's still some eligible area there. We just did a rework of our eligible areas and there was kind of a little panic in the real estate community. Oh, we're going to have a, a whole lot less to work with with rural housing. And actually, we, we kind of tightened up on some donut holes and some weird areas that needed to be tightened up, but we actually did not lose that many so eligible areas. So where do we go areas. if I want to go build myself my dream home, my vacation home on the corner? <laughs> well, um, I've, I've lived my whole life in Virginia. Um, as long as you um, drive out I-66, or 95 South and you get about 80 miles 
um, west or south of the city, then you are in eligible rural area. Even though those counties are part of the Washington, D.C. MSA, they are still eligible. How about the website? Not necessarily <laughs> geographically, where I'm going to build my home. But where do I go to find it so everyone here can find the state? Um, just Google rural, um, USDA eligibility site. It'll take you to that. Um, it, it services a number of different programs that we have. So just make sure in the tabs on the top that you click on housing. Okay. So if we were to cross-correlate a little bit more, um, Sharon, on the procuring contracts, talk to me about what kind of contracts maybe last year. Were they teaching? Were they construction? IT? Talk to me a little bit, maybe one or two that right. you might know. So we, we identify what's called the NICS codes, the areas, the, the, the top NICS codes, and we, we have to do a, um, an annual report to Congress. All the, all the armies need to do that. Um, and our top uh, NICS codes last year were really for illegal services. Um, and the reason for that is that we have been engaged over the last 10 years uh, with Fannie and Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac being in conservatorship we've been engaged in private labor securities litigation, and so we've spent millions and millions of dollars um, on, on law firms, legal services in general. Um, that's about to, to decline, I think, significantly, but we still do spend a fair amount of that. Um, what, what we do hope is that there are subcontracting opportunities within that particular spend, uh, because we, we generally uh, use a few large law firms, and the money overwhelmingly, the spend overwhelmingly goes to them, but it is our hope that by those firms uh, subcontracting out portions of it, that uh, minority-owned uh, and, and, and women-owned uh, law firms will be able to take advantage of that. So that's the legal, legal services, software, uh, software support, uh, hardware, and uh, facilities um, services. Those are our top, uh, top spend. You don't think they just monitor Fannie and Freddie? They still give out money. I mean, 43 million is still a chunk of change. 43 million is still a chunk of change. Yeah, um, um, I personally would like 43 million. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all have room. Um, chunk change to Quinn, but everyone else, you know. <laughs> right, but right? It, it, is, it is small, um, comparatively speaking. Now, Fannie and Freddie, even, you know, and, and so we also regulate the federal home loan banks, and. They, their spend is, is much larger than, than FHFA's. And if um, they're also required to promote diversity and show inclusion, and therefore supplier diversity is a, is a key area of theirs. And if you contact them, um, they would be happy to speak with you about services um, that you can possibly provide. Obviously, it's a competition, generally. Um, but they are looking for minority-owned and women-owned businesses. If I could add on, Desiree, you know, we are also looking for contractors. You mentioned you have four, you have four new openings. <laughs> yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll be hiring four Pathways young people uh, coming on board here in the next month or so. But um, also, too, from a procurement standpoint, you know, we have a lot of opportunities for that. Um, there's appraisal. There's foreclosure services. There's legal <coughs> services. There's consulting. Um, we also um, are um, encouraged to engage with um, small contractors, women and minority owned businesses. Um, we often do that a lot for our consulting work um, because it makes it easy for us because we can just go and pick somebody off the GSA list. There's, there's no rigmarole of paperwork. We look through a short list and we go, those people look like they could do a good job. We have a conversation and then procurement finishes up the paperwork. And opportunities are listed on Fed's <coughs> apps, so the federal opportunities, so make sure that you um, go on that, um, that website, is in essence, and you, you have to know your next codes, however, of the particular business that you're in, uh, because the opportunities are listed under those next codes. What a, what a, so we talked about diverse inclusion, off subject here. We have to bid on the contract, or your name is put into a list, and then she sees out of a few that you're good to do the list. Instead of chasing the person to the bathroom, finding out where they live, stalking them over all the years, everything she just said, everyone in this room should know how to do consulting, 
in every aspect of your doing, should know how to do some kind of real estate disposition, how to hire a contractor in any capacity, and yet it's right here, right? The issue is, is that it's not in your normal frame of book of business, no matter what industry you're in this room, whether you're from the Quinn of the family office side to the Dottie Herman side, or all the way down, Sharon, I think, did exquisite job of displaying how high rises can have the effect of the ills of what she showed of the poverty to the Dottie Herman side of the highest, I think JLo just bought the most expensive penthouse in all of New York, right, with a -Rod? So what a dynamic conversation and elevation is not the price, I guess, depending on where you're right, location, location. So what we're trying to put in, now FEMA, how do you get people to work for FEMA? Do you have procuring contracts too? How do we get contractors? How do you get people to work for FEMA? FEMA comes and helps. So are they employees or do you have contracts that work for FEMA? So it's a combination of both. There's a couple things that we do, especially in a disaster situation. First and foremost, we're gonna deploy uh, our, our full-time employee base. We also have what's called reservists within FEMA that are not typically working in a FEMA facility, but they're active, they're trained, uh, and they're available, they're on call throughout the country. So when you look at our full-time employees and our reservists, there's probably about 12,000 full-time employees, but when you count in reservists and those that are working on disaster focus, we have about a 20,000 person agency within, within the Federal Emergency Management Agency. But what we also do is, and we've done a lot of this in Texas, in Florida, and in Puerto Rico, even in California, is if there is a need for a surge within that community, we'll also, we also have a local hire program. So people that have some experience maybe in inspections or engineering, those are people that we can hire to do uh, field inspections for us or damage assessments that are in the field. If they have administrative experience, and it's, it's a need that we have. Um, so just, just last week, I was in Virginia uh, teaching at a new employee orientation class, and we had about 200 people uh, that were there from Texas, Florida, Puerto Rico, and California that were all local hires from the area of the impacted event. So that is what we look to first because we know we can have them long term, but then we also have contract vehicles that we'll use and we have these national contracts where we will bring people in. I'd much rather hire the local hire because there's people on a disaster that are out of work, they need work, they know their community better than anybody else. That's who my focus would be, but if I need to surge, uh, whether before I can train them up or during the event, we do have contractors as well. Usually also because then you have a tier two, tier, tier three effect, and by the time it gets down to the local people, which who they hire anyway, Correct. you know, they're paid yeah. pennies on the dollar. And, and, and a lot of the times when we have these disasters, they can be very long term, a very long term yes. present for FEMA. We mentioned Katrina some 12 years ago. We still have recovery offices that are open in Louisiana, helping support the long term recovery of that community as well. Well, since we're getting close to wrapping up, how, how can Noemi, your PR, you're out there, you're helping, you're bringing light to all this stuff, you're really helping a very, very abstract section of the, of the uh, diversity piece. How, how can people engage with you and really utilize your expertise? So I'm going to answer that, but I also need to flag something very important for everyone here. Um, www.eco, that's E-C-O hyphen diversity.com. You can find me there, ecodiversity.com. I do consulting work as well. But natural disaster also brings opportunity for entrepreneurs like yourselves. They're touching on some of those, right? Those bid opportunities. Let me tell you what else a natural disaster brings. It basically gives an opportunity for redevelopment to occur. And a lot of the redevelopment that has been occurring in this nation and around the world has been focused around green development. Please take an opportunity to go to the U.S. Green Building Council website. That is USBCG, I think it's .org. They do LEED certification, L-E-E-D, and I'm hoping that NARA will team up in, with them in the future. There's a lot of things that, um, that Desiree has talked about privately. I won't preview them for her. But the L-E-E-D certification is part of the process for individuals who want to become engaged in green building and development. And I know that there was a speaker earlier who was a veteran who said she does construction work.
She would be a perfect candidate um, to become uh, lead Charmaine certified. Sellers. I don't know where she went. I'll talk to her. But even those of you who are in real estate or mortgage, look at the different lead certifications available and consider stepping into that space. It is part of that diversity and inclusion component that has been discussed about needing more women in that space, but also, again, this, this country has an aging infrastructure. And it, was a, it has been a big discussion as part of this administration, right? Trying to funnel funding, funding in to, to build or rebuild some of that infrastructure, whether it's building or roads or, or bridges, whatever the case may be. Again, those, building, those agencies that deal with that, look for contractors like yourselves. Get yourself LEED certified. Green, green, green is the space to go. And so again, if you want to learn more about me, www.eco-diversity.com. I can certainly lead you in that direction. Thank you very much, <laughs> Noemi. Got that? <laughs> anyway, so um, um, since FEMA has done an incredible job in branding that you're just this holier than perfect entity that we find out you're only worth $4,000 and you better take five years and so what is my time worth to fill out your paperwork and the stress of the whole thing, Tell me um, the incredible things that you do do that would really resonate of the top two takeaways, let's say, for this audience. Yeah, so I think if I can say it in short, we help people prepare before, during, and after a disaster, right? So people only see FEMA typically on TV or in the media after a major event has occurred. And typically it has to be major enough for a news cycle to see it. So you see us in Texas and Florida and California and in Puerto Rico, uh, but there were at the time uh, of the events and even now, there's some 200 presidentially declared disasters in this country that FEMA is responding to. So we're there day in and day out, and not just after the disaster, but before and during as well. So there's a lot that we do during the event and assisting with a response capacity if it's needed. We bring the whole of federal government, any federal agency that's, that's necessary in the response to recovery. We talk about both and flooded areas, absolutely. We talk about um, uh, declarations for farmers after an event has occurred uh, in their community from an agriculture perspective. We talk about financial literacy and education and help people, helping people rebuild. So FEMA, in, during, a, during and after disaster, really is that belly button, if you will, to the whole of federal government. FEMA's not in charge of an event. We're there in support of a state or a territory. And what we bring is coordination amongst all federal agencies to the table. Um, our administrator, when there's an active disaster, the president will designate our administrator uh, as the lead for all federal, as the lead federal coordinating agency of that event, and they work across the whole of federal government to do that. But also what's very important is how we help people before a disaster. And that's where we really want to tap into you and your support in, in spreading the word about insurance, because the more people know before a disaster, the more likely they are to respond when an event occurs as well. For those of you that are from this area, Washington, Illinois, probably about 90 miles southeast of here, near Peoria. In 2012, there was a six-year-old boy named Hunter who was in his living room playing video games on a Sunday morning. He's playing his video games like any kid does. I've got a 10-year-old, an eight-year-old, and a five-month-old, and that five-month-old will one day soon be playing video games as well. But playing video games with the tornado sirens went off. Tornado sirens went off and he says to his mom, hey mom, we need to go into the basement. There's, a, there's severe weather. Mom looks out the window, and guess what? It's blue skies with a few white clouds, and she said, now, it's probably a test. We're okay. And six-year-old Hunter was insistent that his mother and his older brother come to the basement because that's what he thought they should do because the tornado siren was going off. Mom finally says, okay, Hunter, let's do it. Come on, big brother. They all go down into the basement, and moments later, an F4 tornado, at 200 miles per hour levels the entire home. Nothing was left standing on that home. They worked their way through their rubble. They were one of 700 homes that day that was completely destroyed. The death toll was eight on that Sunday morning in Washington, Illinois, and it very well could have been 11, but Hunter was insistent that despite the blue sky, they get down to the basement. When media from Chicago descended and ABC 7 News or the Chicago Tribune interviewed Hunter, they said, why were you so insistent, Hunter? He said, because that's what they taught us in school. When the siren goes off, we have to take action. That's a six-year-old kid that for his lifetime will know. 
a lot of people here, when you buy, have you ever had the situation where you buy a new car and all of a sudden you notice that everybody else has the same car you have? And you're like, man, I set a trend. No, you didn't set a trend. It just wasn't important to you the day before when you had your other car. Now that you have that new car, you're noticing it more. And there's time and time again where people see what occurs on TV in Puerto Rico, in Florida, in Texas, and they see it there, but it doesn't, hasn't impacted them directly, so they didn't do anything about it. So the key to what we do is what we do before a disaster, helping communities, helping individuals, helping this great nation prepare so we can bounce back as a safer and more resilient, more secure country. Right, and one of the things I like to tie in from, I'm putting my SBA hat on, is, is that for the Economic Recovery Act, is, is that, again, the same idea. How do we get them to know that there is these funds available and just know about it in everyday life, not about you know, the fact that after? So we came up with an idea that I hope you and, and the, economic, the SBA can team together and we'll be happy to be your champion, is, that's right, we're not using that word, advancing that cause, is, is that to have a flyer put into every grocery store and every convenience store that says, in case of a natural disaster or a man-made disaster, you need to call your servicer, FEMA, and the SBA. So they can get it in their mind that the SBA has nothing to do you know, with just small business, that they have everything to do with the economic recovery. So it's, it's, a, it's a mindset you know, of getting that brand out there, because at the end of the day, They've lost all this money because they didn't meet the guidelines of the timeline to get that done. So I'd like to put that, if you're into so much into training, which you just sure. showed that light, yeah. that needs to be on the grocery stores and convenience stores. Understood. Um, Desiree, in, 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 in response to the hurricanes last year, that was one of the things that we were pushing strongly, and a lot of the servicers were doing mailings and communications to make sure that they added SBA to the list of consideration for borrowers' recovery. The problem is that, I'm sorry, SBA, as soon as you see the name, even the people in the industry, even the people that I called personally drop every one of my staff for two full days and then two weeks, not one person clicked on the link, opened the, the newsletter or anything because the word SBA was written there or the logo was seen. We stripped every logo, everything. We rerouted it to our website three times before it went into the SBA and said, before you click here, this means you has nothing to do with SBA. We literally said that before they clicked to get that, and it took massive amount of man hours. So thank you for that. Sharon, do you have anything in closing? Two ideas. No, just, um, you know, in addition to, to what I mentioned before, there are opportunities that are available for um, primarily smaller vendors. Um, you, can, you can partner with larger vendors under a number of options like the uh, contract and team, teaming arrangement or their mentor mentee programs in the federal government. Explore those and, and, and try and become knowledgeable about them because they are another avenue for, um, for you to, uh, to, to penetrate into that market and, be, and become a federal contractor. Thank you. Michelle, did you finish them? Um. I'll just back what up that Sharon said. We do something very similar over at USDA, um, but also that to let people know that if you know anybody who has a USDA guaranteed loan and they are in a disaster area, that we did create three new disaster recovery options for loss mitigation. They just went into effect about six months ago. And um, I'm really excited about them because what we do in two of the three options is try to avoid term extension. So if you have somebody that's five years, 10 years into their loan, and they don't want to reset back to 30, we actually have new options to protect their term Let's and their current rate. Let's get a resource rate. guide, oh, gee, I don't know who has that, and put all this in that piece for economic recovery. So I know we have a lot of it, but I'm not sure if we have it all. We'll find out tomorrow on, on the panel for the WEIR report. But thank you all very much. Let's give them all a round of applause. <laughs>